one, make it your own, and use it to follow along as we read this morning. You can open, open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 16, and as we do every week, we have the privilege and responsibility of putting ourselves underneath the authority of God's holy inspired and inerrant word, the word that commands us and rejuvenates us, that reveals his glory to us, that is packed with the good news about Jesus Christ, where every word is precious because it comes from God himself. Let's read together Acts chapter 16, verse 6. To verse 15. Speaking of Paul and Silas and their companions, Luke writes this And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Lord bless preaching of your word this morning. I was reminded this week, uh, thinking about this message of a story. I've, I told, told a few of you, mentioned this a number of years ago in the church, but it's, it's worth the retelling uh, just because it's so humiliating. Everybody should know this about me to protect me from myself. Um, so a number of years ago, we had a car parked in front of our home And in the middle of the evening, at some point, someone rounded the corner and ran into it and shoved it way up onto the sidewalk. And when we came home from somewhere we had been out, our car was not where it should have been. It was up against a tree. Uh, Thankfully, there was a note there. A very honest person had left a note, and so we had to get a new car because the car was totaled. And I went into this car purchase opportunity with a certain degree of humility that was vastly insufficient. Uh, I was somewhat aware that I am not the right person to be looking for a car, but I am a grown man, I have children, and I thought some level of me researching this was a good idea, so I looked it up. I found a car on Craigslist that seemed like a great deal, uh, a too-good-to-be-true deal, but I thought it was at least worth investigating. So I drove out to a part of town with my family Uh, an area that I had not been before that I could remember. And as I drove there, finally found my way to the place. We found this car, seemed like a fine car. Uh, I know enough to get in the car and drive it before you buy it. That's about the extent of my knowledge. So I got in the car, I drove it around the block, I hit the brakes a number of times, I know you're supposed to do that. Uh, Nothing bad seemed to happen. And I thought, well, this seems like a pretty good deal. I decided, well, I know you're also supposed to have it checked out by somebody who knows things about cars. Now, this is where uh, the trouble started. I asked the guy selling me the car to recommend a place, or at least he was willing to recommend a place. So we went to a place that he recommended nearby, had a mechanic look at the car, 
The mechanic said, there's a few things wrong with it, but in general, uh, it seems like a, a car that would work. That was what I took from what he had said. So we bought the car and drove home. As I was driving home, everything was fine, made it all the way back uh, to our house, and then subsequently went in to get the registration or whatever inspection that has to be done, and it failed the inspection. So this was the first warning light that was going off in my brain. Something is not good about what has happened. I went to a mechanic shop that I found, and he began to lower the boom. This car needs a lot of work, a lot of work. It needs maybe $1,000 worth of work uh, right now to pass inspection. The light for the check engine has been broken off, um, and I think you need to have that fixed, and a number of other things can be fixed as well. Still not connecting the depth of the danger I'm in. So I say, well, even with that cost, it really still is a pretty good deal. Uh, why don't you go ahead and do that? So he fixes the car, and I don't know anything about cars, obviously, uh, but apparently you have to drive the car a number of miles before it clicks into some, some things are done and it's been accomplished or whatever. I don't even know. So I'm driving the car subsequently, and while I'm driving down the road, something happened. It seemed like to me that while I was driving, the engine fell out of the car, and suddenly it seemed like I was dragging the engine, which didn't make sense in my mind. Why am I still making progress? There's this overwhelmingly offensive sound of dragging engine, and, and I'm going down the road, and I pull off on the side of the road and, and make it into a parking lot, and I call the person that I should have called from the beginning, a mechanic who was a member in our church. Called him said, this is bad. I don't know anything about cars, but this is bad, okay? He came over, looked at the car, and said, why didn't you call me? Why didn't you call me? The transmission is ruined in this car. It is dead, and you cannot, fixing this is going to cost you thousands more dollars. Why didn't you call me? So finally, we had it towed home, and he looked at it more thoroughly, and he began just to say, why? I mean, you could sense that God had worked in his heart because he wasn't swearing, he wasn't, you know, but, but the depth of his, it was some combination of angst and mockery going together in his brain. Why didn't you call me? Well, that story went around the whole church. So then everybody in the church is coming up to me with some kind of sympathetic mockery you know, like combination. I had men coming up to me. Can I, why don't you let me help you get a car, okay? Why don't you, I'll get, I have one for you, okay? And I decided then and there, I'm never buying a car again. I will never buy a car again because I have no idea. I thought I was in control. I was in complete victim motivation. And then the worst thing about it was we're sitting there, and it's my good buddies on the pastoral team, and they were loving this in a somewhat sympathetic kind of way. And we said, I said, well, maybe it's my responsibility to go and confront the guy that sold me this car. Clearly, it was rigged to work for so long and then break. Maybe I should go confront him. That seems like the manly thing to do. You cheated me, right? So we're sitting there, and they have a friend who knows the downtown area. And he said, don't send John down there. Don't send him. Where did he buy this car? I said, well, it's such and such a place. He said, oh, my gosh. Don't send him there. So he went down for me. He drove by. And he called me back and he said, never go there. Never go there. This is a life lesson. There's people with guns sitting outside on their patio with automatic weapons. Why you never, ever, ever go there. So I didn't. I made it a life lesson. <laughs> we sold the car for some whatever low price. And it was a life lesson. And I learned this. I know nothing. I am in complete uh, vulnerability when it comes to buying cars. And this does have something to do with my message, and I'm about to tell you what it is. <laughs> I thought I was in control. I was confident. When I was driving that car around the neighborhood, I thought I knew what I was doing. I'm testing things. I'm braking quickly. I'm accelerating quickly. I thought I could, could control what was happening. The reality was where I thought I thought I was in control. I was not in control at all. 
I had no control. I was completely vulnerable to this guy that was cheating me and his mechanic, probably his friend, that was cheating me. And even the fact that my family was in this neighborhood in our very vulnerable looking minivan uh, next to automatic weapons was extremely dangerous. I didn't even know what I was doing when I showed up and he said, the check engine light is broken off. And I thought, that seems bad. Um, And then he was trying to explain, no, that doesn't happen. Like, you you have to take the thing off to do that, okay? That's not like an accident when you brake too hard. Uh, Somebody did that to you, all right? I had no control over what was happening with this car. No control. The same is true for our salvation, our lives, and ultimately, the advance of the gospel. The same thing is true in the ultimate sense. We have an illusion, I think, of control, and sometimes that illusion gets us into trouble. It puts us in danger. It causes us to be anxious, when in reality, there can be great comfort in doing what I began to do subsequent to that and say, I have no ability ultimately to control that. Now, I'm still there. I'm going to go along for the ride. So when I had to buy a car, once we came into this area, I went and I had Mark Wally on one side of me and Glenn Harvey on the other. I sat down in the chair and I felt terrible for this young salesman who was trying to deal with these guys. It was fantastic. I sat there and said, here's how much money I have, and you can talk to them. And he did. And he was getting it from both sides. And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, What do you think? And what do you think? And it was great. Because I was acknowledging I am not in control of this situation. I have no idea what I'm doing. Even when I think I know what I'm doing, it actually makes it more dangerous because I don't know what I'm doing. Ultimately, ultimately, God is in control of our lives and of the progress of his gospel. And that is the point of this story. That is the point of the story. It breaks into two sections. It starts out with this somewhat strange story about Paul and his companions not being able to go into various places that they want to go. So they're taking initiative. They're attempting to go into places. I don't think they're like me where they're proud and presumptuous. They're just genuinely taking normal initiative. But everywhere they turn, somehow the Spirit God keeps them, corrals them where they can't go there. Did you notice that? And then eventually God leads them all the way to this riverside and they meet this woman. They begin to preach and the text says the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was being said by Paul. So apparently before the Lord was on the scene, she was not even paying attention. She's not even paying attention to Paul. But then God begins to move. She pays attention. She is converted along with her household. There is a small revival in Philippi, and a church is planted. The the, the whole occasion of this story, as Paul starts his second missionary journey, is that God is in control. God holds every person's life and the advance of his gospel in his own hands. He has not finally, ultimately entrusted it to the ability of any person. He holds it in his own hands. And isn't that good news for someone like me? Can you imagine if the gospel was held in my hands with that kind of incompetent background record? What a terrible idea. So God holds it in his own hands. And he brings it about by his own sovereign purpose. All right, let's just walk through these two stories, okay? First of all, sovereign plan, and then we'll call the second sovereign grace. Sovereign plan and sovereign grace. It says in verse 6 that they, Paul and Silas and the team, went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. And then it has this strange saying, they'd been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So then they take more initiative. They go up to Mysia. We have no sense that in doing this they were wrong or they were sinning in any way. They were doing what they thought was best next thing to do. And as they attempted to go into Bithynia, again they're interrupted. The spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So in two different occasions they go and somehow the spirit indicates that is not where you're to be. Now, now. We don't know, and I don't think we should assume to know, exactly how the Spirit indicated this to them. I don't think the main point of the text is how he indicated to them. I think it's that he did. 
Somehow it was clear that they were not to go into these first two places that seemed obvious based on where they were. It seemed like the next logical place to go. And then we have, as Paul is being stymied by the Spirit in every attempt he makes, he has this vision in the night, a man who apparently by his garb or look came from Macedonia, and he's standing there and appealing to Paul, come to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia. I, I think even the, the clarity of this apparent vision uh, is, is meant to speak to the ultimate control that God has over this mission. Because what, I love the, it's almost somewhat of a sarcastic phrase by Luke. We concluded that God had called us to preach the gospel to them because the man said in the vision, come to Macedonia and help us. <laughs> I mean, so I mean, what could be a clearer vision? This isn't one of those vague dreams. You're like, that was weird. I was eating cereal and then I was racing a horse and then I was James Bond and it was really this weird combination and then I was home. No, no, there's a man from Macedonia saying, come and help us. Uh, the whole point of the story is, look, look Paul, Paul is not ultimately in control of this thing. And Silas is not in control of this thing. God is directing this team of church planters precisely where he wants them to be. That's the main point. The, the, even the reference there to the spirit of Jesus, it says the Holy Spirit, and it says the spirit of Jesus. Obviously, this is a very Trinitarian passage. The Holy Spirit is united to Jesus Christ, third person of the Trinity, second person of the Trinity, working together. The, the point here is Jesus Christ is still ruling over the advance of his gospel. He is not absent. He is not passive. He is bringing direction to this mission such that it is in his own sovereign hands. It doesn't mean Paul didn't take initiative. Obviously, it was his idea, apparently, to start this journey. You look back at the last chapter, it's not as though initiative is wrong. It's not as though taking an action without a vision is wrong. No, no, that, that's what Paul does. But the point here is that ultimately, ultimately, God is getting them where he wants them. God is putting them where he wants them to be. Remarkable. Remarkable thing. It's helpful when we think about how was it that the Holy Spirit indicated they weren't to go to these previous places. John Stott is helpful. He says, how the Holy Spirit did his preventative work on those two occasions, we can only guess. It may have been through giving the missionaries a strong, united, inward impression, or through some outward circumstance like illness or Jewish opposition, or perhaps a legal ban, or through the utterance of a Christian prophet, perhaps Silas himself. So we, we, we don't know, it doesn't say, how did the Holy Spirit indicate to them so clearly that they were forbidden, it says, to go into uh, Asia and then they were not allowed to go into Bithynia. We, we don't know that. And I would recommend not assuming we know definitively how that took place. Luke isn't giving us any information. He's just saying it was clear to them that they were not to go here and that then it was clear that this vision was something that gave them some direction and guidance. The ultimate point is God's plan is the plan that will come about. As the, the uh, proverb says, many are the plans in the heart of a man, but the Lord directs his steps. I think this is a living evidence of that taking place. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but the Lord directs his steps. There is a sovereignty that's at work here that we should revel in. Now, I just want to make a quick aside about this concept of guidance, all right? Because if you're like me, uh, that jumps out at you. I don't think it's the main point of the passage. How does God give them this indication? But that he does. But it's worth referencing because here it is. They were guided somehow subjectively by the Holy Spirit into where they were supposed to be, including this vision. Here's, here's how we can think about divine guidance when it comes to this kind of subjective decision. I mean, very important to make a distinction. There are certain things where, because God's word is crystal clear, we need no further guidance. Okay? There is no further guidance needed about whether we should obey God or not. 
And the Holy Spirit would never lead a Christian to disobey God's word because of some subjective guidance. Very, very important because in some uh, charismatic circles, you can start to feel the effect that because the Spirit is moving me in this direction, even though that's not what the Bible says, I still feel the need to obey him. No, that is not the Holy Spirit. He never would lead a Christian to do anything that is not obedience to God's word. So very important. There is no guidance needed when it comes to obeying or disobeying God's word. But within the realm of obedience, should we go to Bithynia or to Philippi, neither of those is disobedient. They're both for the purpose of evangelism. There's no obvious reason why one would be God's purpose and not another. How do we deal with those kinds of decisions? Both obedient. How do we know which way to go? How do we know which thing we should do? I I think a quote by David Peterson is very helpful here. He says this, referencing how Luke talks about guidance in Acts. He says, Luke records several visions that were given to guide key individuals at significant points in their lives. Uh, Acts 7 with Stephen, Acts 9 with Ananias, Acts 9 with Saul, Acts 10 with Cornelius, and so forth, and Peter in Acts 11, uh, Acts 16, 18, 22 with Paul. So a number of places where this sort of subjective impression or vision is given to give some kind of guidance within the scope of obedience. However, in the total record of Acts, such visions are rare and unexpected, important point, by the characters concerned. We should therefore conclude that this is an unusual form of divine guidance. So in the sense of our everyday lives, he doesn't mean it's, it never happens once but every couple hundred years. He's meaning in the ordinary course of life, this is unusual. We cannot expect the regular guidance of visions and prophecies in our everyday decision making, but we are encouraged by Luke's narrative to believe in God's sovereign overruling and intervention to direct the progress of his word and his people where necessary. Meanwhile, the norm that is suggested by Acts is the taking of initiatives for the gospel with wise planning and a loving concern for those we seek to reach, trusting God to open or close the way as he sees best. Whether God's direction comes through circumstances, through prophetic insight, or through a vision, God's people will need to reflect together on the guidance they receive. They will need to relate what is perceived to be the specific will of God in a given situation to the general will of God revealed in the pages of Scripture. Very helpful, very wise, very wise. Now, I I have found that Christians of all denominations tend to agree, though they use different language, that God does lead them subjectively within the bounds of obedience. So you have in certain denominations, people might say, I got a word. Others are very uncomfortable with that uh, because of the use of the word word and the fact that the scriptures are our only authority. Our only infallible authority is God's word. They might say, I felt burdened. So you might have a a good Baptist brother who might say, well, I felt burdened. I felt burdened. And a charismatic says, well, I got a word. Okay, it's probably a similar experience. The point is that there's a, there's, a, there's a sense somehow that God is inclining you to obey in this way rather than in this way. Why does one Christian work in the pro-life center and the other Christian does street evangelism downtown? Uh, why did you choose at one level to marry this person who is a godly Christian person rather than this person who is a godly Christian person? Why, why did you choose to go to this very legitimate college uh, during your college years where there was a wonderful church where you could serve and honor God rather than this city? This co- there's thousands of these kinds of decisions where how do we make that decision? Well, according to Peterson, and I think it's helpful, we take initiatives. We don't have to wait for some kind of subjective guidance. But at some level, there are moments where God seems to give a burden that lends you in a certain direction. And I don't discount the possibility of visions within this boundary line of obedience. Don't discount that because in Acts chapter 2, part of the coming of the Spirit, it says that your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Now, I do, there is a very important state. There are no visions, words, impressions, or anything necessary to know God or the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
There is no word, vision, or oppression, or anything needed to know God or the gospel of Jesus Christ. And no word, vision, impression, burden, anything ever would contradict what is true of the Bible and God's people expressed there according to Scripture. Very important to draw that sharp boundary. But within the boundaries of clear obedience, it may be that God gives impressions or visions or a picture that comes to mind or just the inner prompting in a certain direction that every Christian has experienced to talk to this person or care for this person or serve in this way, that God does give a a way in which we are motivated to serve or encourage or speak or decide in a certain direction. I don't think we wait for those things to make legitimate decisions, but I think it's possible God can do that within the bounds of God's word, shared with others according to wise counsel and community life. They are not infallible. They should never be counted as infallible. And and as a matter of fact, I'm reluctant when people... Uh, even from my background, use the word obedience when they reference a vision. I I would prefer that we not connect that word to visions. I'd I'd rather we use the word obedience when it comes to God's word because that's clear and anything we feel led to might not be of God. It might just be us. We have to have that category of qualification. But there it is in the scriptures. There it is. And as Christians pray and seek God and take initiative, God provides impressions leading them in certain directions to serve in certain ways. I think very helpful. We don't assume that every day. We don't need that to make decisions of obedience. We don't wait on that before we begin to obey God. But it is possible that God can do that within the bounds of obedience. Helpful to think about it that way. The ultimate point of this passage, as I said, though, is not how he directed them, but that he did. That he did. Somehow, contrary to all human wisdom and initiative, geographically, God gets Paul to a river in Philippi. (laughs) Contrary to what Paul thought was the best place to go, what was obvious the best place to go from a geographic standpoint, what seemed to make sense to Paul, God gets Paul to a river in Philippi to meet a woman named Lydia. So who ultimately has this plan in his own hands? It is the sovereign Lord. God is going to save that woman, and so he gets this team to her on that riverside on that day having somehow indicated to them they can't go this way, they can't go this way, don't go this way, and yes, come over to Macedonia and help us in this vision. They say, well, there's nothing disobedient about going there, so maybe that's of the Lord. Maybe let's, try, let's go that direction. And so they go, and then it comes all the way to this river with this woman whose heart is opened. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has a sovereign plan for your life and for the progress of the gospel, and he will lead you in it. He will lead you in it. He will not be thwarted by your best guess as to what you're supposed to do. He is not limited by my intelligence or yours. That's good news. God's goodness and plan is not limited by your intelligence. Because your intelligence would have led you into Bithynia and Asia too. But apparently that's not where God wanted them to be. And so your intelligence, your best guesses, which are valid and legitimate to pursue normally, they are not greater than the sovereignty of God to lead you where he wants you to to be. Wonderful. It's such a comforting text. Even Paul doesn't know where he's supposed to be. Paul doesn't know. Silas doesn't know. They don't even know. They're just trying to make decisions. Why? Oh, this makes sense. Let's just go into this land. Lots of people need to hear about Jesus. And God redirects them. Wonderful, comforting, motivating when we think about our own lives. Yes, we take initiatives. Yes, we take action. Yes, we obey according to God's word. And God is able to redirect us. Whether it be through some inner impression or some encouragement that is shared by a fellow brother and sister, he, he is able to bring up another option in our hearts. He's able to do that. Our greatest destiny is to be useful instruments in the sovereign hands of God for the salvation and blessing of his people. 
And that destiny will come about because God is sovereign. Our greatest destiny is to be useful instruments in the sovereign hands of God for the salvation and blessing of his people. I, 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 love, I don't love everything about this show, but I love this part of the Thomas the Train uh, world and the island of Sodor and Mr. Topham Hat, which is the weirdest name I've ever heard of, but he's the guy that runs the railroad and all these little trains go back and forth and, and they have this phrase that they use that is like their ambition in life and it is to be a really useful engine. And the worst thing that could happen is for them to cause confusion and delay. They want to be a really useful engine and not cause confusion and delay. Now, our heart should be towards this sovereign God. Make me a useful Christian. I don't want to cause confusion and delay. That should be our disposition. Lord, wherever you want me to go, whether it be in local service or extra local service or planting a church or going out of the country or serving in this difficult area, wherever you want me to go, I want to be a useful Christian to your kingdom. I don't want to cause confusion and delay. But here's the good news of this passage. God will make his people useful to his own purposes, and he is not limited by their own impressions about where they should be. Because even Paul, with all of his intentions to be useful, ultimately had to be guided by the sovereign hand of God to get to that riverside, meet that woman that God wanted to save. What a, what a comforting passage this is. That's true for you. Yes, should our heart be to be useful? I, I don't want to cause confusion and delay. I, I want to be useful to you, Lord. And as we offer that heart to him, the promise of this passage is God will use you where he wants you. Our best intentions may not be God's purpose. God's perfect will is not limited by our intelligence. What this means is that we can trust God when our plans are thwarted too. We can trust God when our plans are thwarted too. John Stott says about Paul and his team, they must have been in a state of considerable perplexity, <laughs> wondering what God's plan and purpose were, for so far their guidance had been almost entirely negative. No, I mean, can you imagine what that was like for them? I, again, I don't know how God led them, but somehow they start to go here, and somehow there's great clarity over well, we're not supposed to be there somehow. It's very clear. So we try, okay, let's come. Oh, no, not, not supposed to be there either. And I can relate to that in my own life when my good intentions are interrupted. They, they weren't sinning. These were good intentions, but they're interrupted. I, I, I thought about you moms, especially with small children. How many times are your good intentions interrupted? Like nine million times a day? Good intentions interrupted. What this passage is saying is God has purpose for his interruptions of our good intentions. You dads that had a certain plan for how you were going to serve God in your workplace, and for some reason those good intentions were interrupted. God has a good intention for his interruption of your good intentions. Those of you that, that look back at your life and you think, man, that, that plan was interrupted, and that plan was interrupted, or, or even the whole concept of a mid-age mid crisis, mid-life crisis, everything's been interrupted that I planned for. God has a good purpose for his interruptions in your good intentions. Because of his sovereign plan, he holds your life and my life in his own hands, and he gets us where he wants us to be. Good news, brothers and sisters. Very, very good news. Perhaps we had a certain vision for how we were wanting to serve God, and he somehow throws an obstacle or an unexpected opportunity in our way. We need to view the interruptions of life as God's appointments. View the interruptions of life as God's appointments in his sovereign hand. Sovereign plan. Secondly, sovereign purpose. Sovereign grace. I'm sorry. Sovereign plan, sovereign grace. They set sail. 
Having been motivated by this vision to at least attempt to go into Macedonia, they set sail, they make their way finally to this significant city of Philippi, a leading city of the district, a Roman colony. They remain in the city for some days, and on the Sabbath, it would seem as though there was not enough Jewish people, Jewish men, to have a synagogue where they normally would begin their evangelism. And so when that wasn't the case, people would sometimes gather at the riverside for prayer, And so they go there where they suppose there's a place of prayer, and they're not disappointed. They sit down, and there's apparently some women there who have gathered together. One who heard them was a woman named Lydia. So she is gathered with these God-fearing women. She seems to not be a Jewish woman. She's a Gentile, but she has some fear of God, and so she gathers with Jewish women. She's a seller of purple goods that would have been uh, costly garments uh, for those that were wealthy, and she was a worshiper of God. So she has no awareness of Jesus Christ as the Savior, but she has some general sense of a fear of God. She is relating in some way to the uh, Old Testament Jewish understanding of God, and, and she's there, and she is listening or hearing uh, Paul speak about the good news of the gospel. And the climactic phrase of this lengthy, surprising, interrupted journey happens down there where it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. I love the beauty of this picture. Think about this. Paul, who was a hater of God, the church hunter, gets interrupted by the Lord Jesus Christ, converted, and then he is set on this new path of planting churches. And on the second journey, he's trying to go here and he can't. He's trying to go here and he can't. Finally, he's called in this direction. He goes in this other direction, and here he is. He's at the riverside. He's been there a few days. He just begins to speak the good news. We can imagine what he's saying. There, there, there is this Jewish man, and he revealed himself to be God by the divine power of his works. And then, against all expectation, he said that he was going to have to go and die on a Roman cross and be under God's curse. But, but he said that was what he wanted to do all along, because he was going to be a sacrifice for sinners. And because he died, everybody, Jews and Gentiles, can repent of their sins and receive the forgiveness of God. And so Paul is sharing this at the river. He's sharing about Jesus and how he died for sinners and how in him there is a new kingdom that can be entered into by faith. And how Jesus is the king who will one day return for his people and they will be restored and and brought into his kingdom. And he's saying, anyone, you, you, what's your name? Lydia, you, you can believe in Jesus. You can believe in Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. He died on the cross to save sinners, just like me. Let me tell you about myself. I was a blasphemer, an insolent opponent. I hated God's people. I I carried them off to prison, and yet I met Jesus Christ on the road one day, and he knocked me off my horse and knocked me off my pride and brought me to my knees, and now I see him as as more worth anything than than I could possibly have. Actually, I, I count everything as a loss compared to the greatness of knowing him, and I really want you to know him too. If you believe in him, he will be your personal savior also. Lydia, do you want to believe? And as he's speaking, God does something. She's hearing his words, but apparently she is not paying attention. And suddenly, she is paying attention. She's not paying attention, and suddenly, she is paying attention. She's hearing him, but she's not being transformed by what he's saying. And suddenly, God reaches into her heart and opens her heart to hear what Paul is saying and to realize this is true, and this is for me. And God takes the salvation of this woman in his own hands and opens her heart and plants the seed of the gospel, and it begins to bear fruit of conversion and repentance. Brothers and sisters, with every one of us, it was the same. Every one of us was the same. God's gospel 
started in eternity past, revealed in the coming of Jesus Christ, who died for sinners, is then brought to a person like you and me. And in our hearts, you know what happened? A heart that was listening but not paying attention is opened by divine power. And suddenly we see Jesus as not just a good guy from back 2,000 years ago, but a Savior who can rescue us from our sin and bring us into relationship with God. That's what happened to you if you're a Christian. God, open your heart to see what you could not see, to pay attention to what you could only hear. And it doesn't matter if you grew up in the church and you've heard the name of Jesus 9,000 times. There will come a day if you are willing to hear that God will open your heart and see Jesus Christ for the first time. And if you weren't a church kid and you grew up somewhere else wandering into every other pagan pursuit and trying to get all kinds of pleasure in this world, God did the same thing to you. He opened up your heart to see the glory of Jesus Christ and to hear and to pay attention to the good news of the gospel. It's a marvelous story. Luke includes Lydia in such a way that it motivates all of us to remember our moment when we were minding our own business by the side of some river. And all of a sudden, God opened up a closed heart. This story is a beautiful picture of grace. The gospel travels all of those miles until it finds her by the riverside. God had Lydia in mind when he was saying, no, Paul, no, Paul, now come over here, now go to this river, here she is, start talking, and God opens her heart. And God had you in mind for thousands of miles and years when he brought the word from person to person to person until finally it spoke into your ear, and rather than your ears closed, they were opened by sovereign grace, and you were allowed to see the good news that Jesus is who he says he is, and because of him I can have salvation and forgiveness of sins in his name. God takes the salvation of his own people totally into his own hands. He entrusts it to no human ability, no human confidence, no human presumption. He takes it in his own hands and he opens up hearts to see the glory of Jesus Christ, just like Lydia did. Her life is transformed. She is baptized along with her household. That This would have included servants as well as family members that apparently have expressed faith in Jesus as well. They have believed in him. And then they are all baptized and she immediately says to Paul, come and allow me to host you. Allow me to offer you my home. Wonderful, wonderful transformation of life. Now, I think this story of sovereign grace does at least three things for us. I think it motivates our evangelism. Because you notice, though God is sovereign in directing Paul, he takes Paul by his own hands and gets him where he wants him. And ultimately, it's the Lord and not Paul that opens Lydia's heart. Notice that. Notice that. It is the Lord and not Paul, the Lord and not Lydia that opens Lydia's heart. Very important that we understand the sovereign grace of God in conversion. But it does motivate our evangelism because his sovereign work works through the preaching of Paul. It works through the preaching of Paul. Very important that we see it that way. And that same is true for us. We can speak the gospel with comfort and confidence knowing that the Lord is able to open the heart of those we speak to. They might be minding their own business at a coffee shop or in a sandwich shop or your neighbor. And yet God has brought you there to their own personal riverside. And when you start talking about Jesus Christ, the Lord is able to open their hearts. Now, we don't know if every woman there was converted. Maybe some of them said, that's nice, and went on their way. But for Lydia, it was the moment. It was the divine appointment. And it might be the divine appointment for some that I talk to or you talk to. Some conversation that we start might lead to a gospel opportunity. I, I was just had a 
lengthy time of, of sitting uh, in a cell phone shop this week, and I, I was talking to this young guy at the counter, and all of a sudden it struck me like, I got nothing to do, I, I'm waiting, I have to wait for a little while, and so I, I'm just trying to, to ask him about his life, and, and, and talk to him, and, and it's on my mind, okay, is there any way I can insert the gospel, there, there didn't seem to be a moment where I could do that, helpfully, but, but, but I, was, I was thinking that way. I was trying to think, okay, I, I want to start to get to know him. I'm supposed to go back next week to figure something else out. And so I'm thinking, maybe, maybe when I come back, I can continue the conversation. And maybe at least I can invite him to church if he can come. Or... And then I went and had my hair cut. And this young guy telling me all about his life and what he's doing. And I'm thinking, okay, how can I draw him out about his life and communicate that I care about what's going on in his world? Because you never know. One of those moments might be their time by the riverside. It motivates our evangelism. It also, this, this picture of sovereign grace, it, it, it reminds us that sovereign grace results in a transformed life. Notice that she is baptized because she wants to profess publicly that she believes in Jesus Christ. This is not for her a private conversion. It is a public declaration. This is not a, a private uh, internal religious inclination. It is a public confession of faith. She wants to be baptized. And not only that, she wants her home to be useful to the Lord for the forward progress of the gospel because God has his people in his own hands. Those that belong to the Lord, their conversion and subsequently the course of their life is in his hands. Very very important to to remember that. It's very helpful. I, I was reading uh, John Stott on this passage, and and he says, where the heart is opened, the home is open too. What what, what a wonderful way of saying that. Where the heart is opened, the home is open too. Lydia just assumes, well, if, if he's claimed my heart, then certainly my home, my life, my resources are at his disposal too. It's no inconvenience to be inconvenienced for the gospel. Results in a transformed life. And finally, it should cause us to cherish our own conversions. It should cause us to cherish our own conversions. This, this picture of sovereign grace, sovereign direction, that we're not given all the details of, but it's very clear that God was directing Paul in that opening passage, leads to this moment of sovereign grace where the Lord opens this woman's heart and he results in a, that results in a salvation for her household as they confess and believe in Jesus, a baptism. And apparently we find out later that it is in Lydia's home. It seems as though the church in Philippi is meeting. So this becomes a a place of worship for the church to gather and and worship the Lord. All starts here. That church that will eventually hear the words of Paul, whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ Jesus. Let this mind be among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Though he had equality with God, counted it not a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. That started here. It should cause us to cherish our own conversions. Both for ourselves and for the unknown purpose of God that he has in saving us. Brothers and sisters, all of us were Lydia minding our own business, hearing the gospel, but not paying attention. And when we did pay attention, it was because God had taken our salvation in his own hands and made it journey from eternity past until it met with us. Charles Spurgeon, speaking of his own conversion, says this. One weeknight... When I was sitting in the house of God, I was not thinking much about the preacher's sermon, for I did not believe it. (laughs) The thought struck me, how did you come to be a Christian? I sought the Lord. But how did you come to seek the Lord? The truth flashed across my mind in a moment. I should not have sought him, 
unless there had been some previous <coughs> influence in my mind to make me seek him. I prayed, I thought. But then I asked myself, how came I to pray? I was induced to pray by reading the scriptures. How came I to read the scriptures? I did read them, but what led me to do so? Then in a moment, I saw that God was at the bottom of it all and that he was the author of my faith. And so the whole doctrine of grace opened up to me. And from that doctrine, I have not departed to this day. And I desire to make this my constant confession. I ascribe my change wholly to God. The Lord has taken the lives and salvation of his people, you and me, into his own hands for his own glory. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for opening our heart to pay attention. And thank you, Lord, for the many places the word could have gone. And in your mercy, you chose to direct it to our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving our sister Lydia. Thank you for her generosity in hosting that church. Thank you for saving every Christian brother and sister that is here in this room. And Lord, for any for whom this is the day of salvation, I pray right now you would open their heart. You would cause them to repent of their sins and believe in you as Savior. Lord, cause all of us to gladly admit our own powerlessness in the face of this life and ultimately to entrust ourselves to your hands for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If for any reason we can pray for you, pastors or community group leaders, uh, they will be up here, we will be up here. We love praying for you. I was just talking to a, a friend yesterday, a young friend, and I was just saying personally, look, if even just in the ordinary battle of the Christian life, you want to come forward and, and just give me an update how you're doing, let me pray for you. Um, I, I want to express that to all of you. Please, please feel free. Come up, let us pray for you. For the rest of you, have a grace-filled week, and we'll see you either at community group or next Sunday.